Kirby Connects. Man, we are in the home stretch of trying mm-hmm. to help you understand a little bit of the Bible that you're reading, especially some of those tough places in the Old and the New Testament. Uh, we're coming up on Revelation here pretty quick. Just got out of Ezekiel, uh, mm-hmm. wrapping up Daniel, and we're in that uh, um, eschatological part of Daniel. So we're really happy to be sharing this time with you. You know, for the last so many weeks, I'm always the one asking the question. Uh, but today we're going to let Don ask the question. Awesome. Oh, <laughs> we're going to let Don, Don. We're gonna let Don ask the question. I got it. Because I he is it. so okay. good in the moment. And yeah, the is. In the moment, in the room. I'm killing it. In the, room. in the moment, I'm killing it. What is your favorite winter sport, guys? We are in the winter oh. sport time right now. Like, what is it that you enjoy so much that you would leave the comfort of 72 degrees, um, climate-controlled room, and go outside whoa, whoa, whoa. and engage in? That's different. Yeah, don't be crazy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you mean like you go bowling? That's a winter sport. Okay, okay. Bowling, bowling could be a winter sport. Basketball, is a winter basketball could be a winter what sport. What do you watch on TV? What do you watch on TV? <laughs> I, I, okay, yeah, okay. I had an answer. Okay, let's go to that. We'll go to that. I, I, was, I was trying to get us out of the room, but let's go for that. What's, what's your favorite winter sport uh, you enjoy then? You know what? To watch, to view. Winter Olympic sport. I love Ooh. the I love the luge. They have one that's kind of like it now, but like the whole deal where you're just laying completely flat and recklessly going. One man luge. That's called the skeleton. Yeah. Is that Is the skeleton? Yeah, because I, I I watched it last time and I thought, well, that yeah. it's different. It's a smaller kind of deal. Yeah. But and like you control it with your feet. Yes. <laughs> it's like going down feet first. Recklessly fascinating. It was yeah. birthed in Pennsylvania in 1826 Steve on the one-man sled. That's right. <laughs> Don has Wikipedia out right now. <laughs> Bal- Balpo sent a couple guys, aren't they? Huh? Balpo's got a they are, Balpo. They're <laughs> Balpo uh, Olympic. Uh, uh, they had to Olympic pull their loose team, team yeah. to That's bring awesome. a success that happened in football. Yes. Would you ever do it? Man, I'd try it. Do they have such a thing as a yes, bunny skeleton hill? <laughs> people die doing this. I know, can't, this is oh, like no, a bunny no, loose hill. Death. People die doing all kinds of things. I just pour ice on my yes. driveway. <laughs> no, no, no. Like Lake Placid, Lake Placid, New York, or Whistler in Canada, where they've had the Olympics before. Yeah. yeah. You can oh, do that. Oh, man. Emery's thinking about 20 trip. foot. I am. Emery's thinking about 20 foot elevation drop. Okay, guys. The hill. Me. The hill. Oh, yeah. the oh no, that's the hill. The water the hole hole is no. in my driveway. The, the hill is like, like a black diamond skeleton. compared to the hill. <laughs> thinking, you know. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm doing All right. Hill. All right. What are you guys thinking? Oh, uh, mine would be, I love watching the, like, Winter X Games. All the snowboarding, skiing. Oh, look like at that, that for the millennial in the room. The yeah. winter yeah. snowboarding your... archery thing combined. That one gets me. I, I just look at them and I get tired. <laughs> they're sitting there like cross country skiing. Have yeah. to hold their breath uh-huh. and shoot. That's the pathalon. Uh, Look see, at that. This guy Pastor. is a dictionary. No, that's, Man, that's, winter that's, fun. That's my favorite one. I, I is it really? Look at that. Yeah, it if is kind of cool. If I could do, I mean, just to slow your breathing down yeah. where you can hold your gun steady yeah. after just running on skis. Oh, it basically. is so James Bond like. No. Yeah. But that might not be the same. For we need a little James Bond music just coming up <laughs> in the background. So you would do the the X Games, X or, Games. or that side of the Winter Olympics. That's what yeah. would get me out of seventy-two degree weather too. <laughs> to go skiing, it would take sure. that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm saying that would get you out of seventy-two. So what would you get out of seventy-two degree room for? I, I would get out of seventy-two degree room to go skiing, to go snow skiing. I enjoy some snow skiing. Yeah, you do. I don't do it very much. I've thought. I've looked. I've looked at. Um, Caberfay Peaks, that's my favorite place to go because of their low price and good family quality. And then they've got this, they have about 50 outlet, electrical outlets, and people just bring their crock pots with something frozen in it, huh. and they all plug them in. So there's literally like 50 families or groups that are lined up all their crock pots, and then they turn it on, and by the time they get off the mountain at 12 or 1 o'clock, everyone's has warmed up, and then they've got this wonderful... Hot, Sweet. you know, Don chili. just brings a bowl and a spoon. <laughs> I just got, I sample them all. That's my favorite winter sport. The whole, the whole snow skiing part. Uh, <laughs> if I have to. Soup sampling. <laughs> Soup sampling. Thank you. <laughs> Fun fact, Caberfay Peaks is owned by the Meyer family. Fred mm-hmm. Meyer uh, was the... Uh, uh, so this is our, in Michigan. Yes, yes, yeah. of our Meyer stores, you know, Amazing. here. Amazing. Yes. No, not the stores, but I mean... Caberfe is in Michigan. Yeah. yeah. Is uh, it really? I've never heard of it. It's it's up in out next close to Cadillac. Okay. Yeah. 
I'm pretty pretty showing nice up an spot. hour early while everybody's skiing and having a real good <laughs> <laughs> Guys, you're going to love it. Potato soup, a little more salt. <laughs> Tip of the day from God. Just to be a blessing. Just to be a blessing. Oh, God. Well, speaking of blessing, let's jump into God's word here and start with the Old Testament as we wrap up in Daniel. Oh, my land. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so we're at the end of Daniel, the last two chapters. And I got a lot to cover today, so I just want to say a couple different comments about that. Uh, One thing that is awesome uh, throughout the book of Daniel, or two different places, I think it's uh, chapter 1 and chapter 7, where if you look closely, it lays out the next four world empires, Babylon to the Median Persians, to the Greeks, and to the Romans. And it comes true, it mm. takes centuries for it to happen, and there is not one notable secular archaeologist or historian who will disagree with it. Mm. And I just think it's one of those points... That is so often like you. You can't deny that it's there. Uh, we don't need that because we have the Holy Spirit and because we're already followers and believers. But to a world that that small portion in our culture that is like looking for everything to line up and timelines and all that, I think that's really a small portion in our culture. But it it, it is there that like twice he predicts the same thing that would be impossible to predict. Uh, empires that w- were barely anything at the time later on would, be- would become the world empire. And then when we get to the end, uh, uh, Pastor Mike said something that is so is so true. Daniel 12 reads like Revelation. Uh, so the little heading at the top of it, which we all know the headings, the chapter headings, they're not scripture. They weren't there for several hundred years. But even the title of that heading says the end times. And uh, chapter 12 says... Uh, At that time, Michael, the great prince who protects your people, will arise. There will be a time of distress such as not happened from the beginning of nations until then. But at that time, your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book, will be delivered. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens, and those uh, who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. I, it sounds so mm. out of revelation mm-hmm. for does. me. It's just like it's it just a parallel of everything that happens. I'm going to give you my uh, my extremely shallow theological thing on all uh, eschatological things. Uh, my philosophy is he's coming and I'm going. <laughs> There we go. Mm-hmm. When that, it all starts coming down, I'm going up. Yeah, that the, the end has already been determined. Mm-hmm. It is not a battle that is yet to be decided. It has already been determined. And based on his righteousness, which can never be shaken, that it's as simple as that. Because I think you can really get scared and, and lost and confused in trying to figure out every twist in every turn. But at the end of the day, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, your destiny is set. You are good. And that's the main thing. And that's the point of prophecy. When we look through all of these uh, uh, Old Testament books, now we're on to the minor prophets, not minor because of their impact, minor because of the amount of words that are written. Uh, it, it's all about what? Knowing that you belong to God. And so it's as simple as that. If you belong to God, Pastor, Pastor Mike did this awesome series on Revelation so many years back, and it was so good at, like, Revelation is not a book to be afraid of. Mm -hmm. Revelation is a book that says, your future is certain. You, it's done for you. It it is finished for you. And and I love that. So, going, that's that's it with Daniel. Hosea, oh my lands. When you talk about uh, the prophets having object lessons, A lot of times their lives or part of their lives are to be watched as a symbol of what God is trying to communicate to the nation of Israel. So he is a prophet to the northern kingdom of Israel during uh, Jeroboam, super bad king. Uh, But so here's the message that he gets. Take for yourself an adulterous wife and child, children of unfaithfulness. That is like, I'm like, what? And he does that, right? So he, mm-hmm. he, he 
takes this woman that's his wife, and then she ends up leaving, committing adultery, having children, and then God says, okay, now take her back into your house. And not only that, in that culture, he pays for her to come back. Mm -hmm. So all of this, his heart is rent into, and all this terrible stuff that he has to endure, and then he's to take her back. And the whole thing is a picture to a largely non-literate society who is not getting it of that unfaithful wife is Israel. And that God will take you back regardless. But you need to turn and, and you need to follow him. So he is the extreme uh, object lesson uh, of the minor prophets. But th there's some really good points in this really small book. I, I love how it uh, puts next to each other knowledge versus personal knowledge. There is a difference between knowing about Jesus and knowing Jesus. Uh, it reminds me of, they used to have all these shows on the History Channel all the time, and it, they would be shows about someone would be out with Jesus or things in the Bible. And usually, if the guy had a doctorate in world religions, that meant he knew a lot about God and probably didn't know God. Because usually their theology wouldn't line up with anything that we said. But uh, for us, as we go through life, uh, you know what? I had read the Bible all the way through before I was a follower of Jesus Christ. I, if you ask me questions, I mean, I grew up in a Christian home. I could tell you a ton of things about God, but I didn't know God. There's a difference. Our goal is not to know about God. Our goal is to know God, which means relationship. Uh, a couple other things that are super important in that little tiny book. Uh, they were worshiping God and worshiping false gods at the same time. It wasn't like they said, oh, we don't want anything to do with Yahweh. We're just going to follow Baal. Somehow they had worked themselves into a place where they felt comfortable going to the temple and then going and offering sacrifices to Baal at the same time and did it week after week after week. And it made me think of this. There's only one person that can be on the throne. You can't have two people on the throne. So they really weren't worshiping God. And it made me think of us. Uh, with the choices that we make every day, uh, what does this choice say about who is on the throne today? So I can make myself on the throne every day of every choice that I want to, or I can make God on the throne of that. The, the authority, ultimate authority for what choices that uh, I make in life. So... They, they were in the middle, and you can't be in the middle. The Bible says that a person with a divided heart is not a good thing. So God is trying to, in essence, win them back to being wholehearted servants uh, of, of him and him alone. Uh, and I love how the a book in chapter 14, verse 9 says, it, so uh, wisdom literature, it's so wisdom literature, uh, who is wise, he will realize this. Who is discerning, he will understand this. The ways of the Lord are right, and the righteous walk in them, but the rebellious stumble in them. It's a really simple message. All of the prophetic books are really simple messages of follow God. Follow God. Life is just better if you follow God. Mm -hmm. it's, just, it's as simple as that. Really quickly, because there's so much. The book of Joel. Uh, Joel is let all. Me, let me yeah, uh, go ahead. let me just kind of for before we leave Hosea. Mm -hmm. um, Hosea represents the faithfulness of God. Mm -hmm. Gomer is us. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely, yeah. It, we are Gomer in the story because yeah, in that time ones, it would have been the nation of Israel. For us now, that's us. That's our application. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because we, uh, how many times do we lose? Mm. You know, we start off and we're interested, but we lose interest. Um, you know, just as Gomer lost interest in Hosea, we lose interest in um, our relationship with God, and we start to take it for granted, and we stop reading the Bible, we church attendance get shaky, all of those things that strengthen our faith, you know, or strengthen that relationship. 
And so as you read through Gomer, realize that yeah. what God is saying is, listen, I represent the Hosea factor here. Yeah. You are the Gomer factor. See Absolutely. yourself clearly. Absolutely. You know? And I think sometimes we underestimate, uh, we overestimate our righteousness and underestimate our ability <laughs> to fall off the rails because all of us at times can run after things mm-hmm. and not run after God. And, yep. that, and that's the very graphic picture, by the way, in the book of Hosea, of someone running after immediate pleasure, uh, immediate gratification, uh, running the opposite way from God. So super quick on, on Joel. Joel is full of uh, prophetic poems. Uh, I want to see where they put it in the chronological Bible when we do it next time, because, you know, there's no marker in there that says when it was written. We know this is written after a bunch of the other prophets because he quotes probably like nine prophets in his writing, but there's nothing that ties it to something. There's a lot of guesses about uh, about when it should be. And it never lists a particular sin that Israel is guilty of. Uh, and most people think the reason is that he's saying, hey, I've quoted all these other prophets. You've read all these other people. Y'all know what you're doing. Mm. I don't need to say it again. Uh, but there is just, because I don't want to take a ton of time, two things you need to know. The day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is the theme of Joel. The day of the Lord is not a good thing. The day of the Lord means God is coming after you. He has tried to get you to change your ways. And there is a day that is coming. And God is long-suffering. And God is slow to anger. But he's true. And what he says, he means. And you can, you can only play with it so long. Because truth truth is truth. But there there is a, a verse that I just love. In this, in this, actually, I'm reading in NIV. Uh, Rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love, and he relents uh, from sending calamity. And I, I just love that. It speaks to, for one thing, like, don't just go through the motions. Don't just go through the rituals. In that culture, yeah, you could give the appearance of mourning about things by outwardly ripping your clothes and, and going about in a certain way. Uh, but you, you could actually do that and not really be repentant. You could just look that way to people around you. And, and God is really calling for it. He says, give me your hearts. He's calling, he's calling for your hearts. He's calling for real repentance uh, that leads to what? That leads to an awesome God waiting with his arms open to embrace you as his child, no matter where you are, no matter where you've been. Yeah, that is good stuff. Let me ask you guys, because you're going to talk about Revelation here in just a bit. Why, what is the fascination with the conspiracy theories? In our culture, for Christians, because I'm always amazed, I can understand why an unbeliever would be interested in it, but... The conspiracy theory for the believer, the fascination is what? I think the fascination is, is knowing the unknown. Yep. Is People the ability, like out. right, to the yeah. ability to know the unknown. Because we serve and follow a God who is sovereign and timeless and is eternal and knows everything, then you know, we're like, how much of that are you going to, how much of that are you going to, and we have God's word, which reveals much mystery to us, but there's still so much faith that is, that is, that is demanded of us in following the Lord. I, I, the exact thing. I, I was thinking how much faith it requires. It's like telling, telling your children when they're this age, I can tell you a little bit of what I need to tell you about this, but you'll mm. know, mm. you'll know, you'll know down the road, you'll know down the road. It requires us to do something uh, our culture hates to do to admit we are not the authority and the be all and the end all. God is, and in the end, we just have to say, I, I don't understand this, but I don't have to understand everything. I just trust you. And that's a big order when it comes to the stuff that's in Revelation and the end of Daniel. Yeah, I'm always amazed because people go, you know, and they get all wrapped up in the, you know, Gog and Magog and they, you know, and who's what. And I remember as a kid, Henry Kissinger was to be the Antichrist. Yeah. I heard that preached over and over again. And, you know, as I read through prophecy, and everybody knows it's not my, it's not my um, 
first love in the Bible, but we do know how it ends. Yeah. We know exactly how it Absolutely. ends. Absolutely. God is still on the throne at the end of the day. Righteousness prevails, not because we are righteous, but because we found our righteousness in Christ, and our righteous God is still on the throne. Yeah. And Give everything in between on. here and there, you know, God does not have to tell us every detail. No. You and know? sometimes we cause ourselves great harm when we try to explain things that are literally his thoughts or beyond our thoughts. There's always been a, th a theory for every generation. If you go back far enough, but when the Social Security number started, people oh, were yeah, like, six, six, six. the Social Security is number on. is the mark of the beast. They're, you know, and if you ask somebody today, you'd be like, what is the Social Security number? that was followed by something else that was represented something and something else will always be that and I think the end question is like does that theory lead you closer to God does it lead you to love God and love people more or no yeah, who, who are you putting your trust in yeah in, in what you can gather together or are you putting your trust in God yeah your trust in figuring it out yourself or yeah. your trust in going I don't want to have a clue but I trust the one who said it yeah I just always try to challenge people you know if you spend if you spend four or five hours trying to study the latest conspiracy theory a week, at least spend one hour trying to tell somebody else about Jesus. Yeah. 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 That's, Taylor so good. talked about that and just you come back to that conclusion of, okay, well, where does that fit into Scripture? How does that fit? In, where's that line up with Scripture? Taylor's good about just dropping nuggets of wisdom. <laughs> yes, and, uh, I remember people like joking, somewhat joking, but I think they were somewhat serious about like, we just need to start commune. We just need, to, and Taylor goes, how's that fit the Great Commission? And I was like, well, we're done here. <laughs> 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 Drop the mic. Drop the mic. I'm telling you. All right, good stuff. Well, let's go to Revelation. Well, well uh, here's what I would like to do today. I'm going to... I'm going to hit Revelation, and I'm actually going to go backwards because we're only going 20 verses into Revelation today. And then the next three recordings after this, for me, in the New Testament, will all be Revelation. Um, but I do want to start there just to lift out where Emery was going from Daniel to Joel and the fact that God is on the throne. Um, Revelation is given to us because Jesus will return. Here's a, here's a central thing. Jesus will return to rescue his people and settle accounts with all who defy him. It's a book of warning, and it's a book of hope. And John begins this book by explaining how he received his revelation from God, and I just want us to hear the word of the Lord in Revelation 1, verse 4. Grace and peace to you from the one who is, who always was, and who is still to come, from the sevenfold spirit before his throne, and from Jesus Christ. He is the faithful witness to these things, the first to rise from the dead and the ruler of all the kings of the world. All glory to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by shedding his blood for us. He made us a kingdom of priests for God, his father, all glory and power to him forever and ever. Amen. Look, he comes with the clouds of heaven and everyone will see him, even those who pierced him and all the nations of the world will mourn for him. Yes, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord God. I am the one who is, who always was, and who is still to come, the Almighty One. And I'm just returning to Emery's former question or that he had posed to us about who's on the throne. And our Pastor Mike preaches at, well, uh, at youth camps, he would always preach who you can only have one, one on the throne. That was... Such a powerful message that, that he brought youth camp in my earlier days of youth ministry. But it is the truth. The one who is the Alpha, the Omega, beginning and end. The one who is, always was, and who is still to come. The Almighty One. He's the one who has the right to sit on the throne of our hearts. And anything else on that throne of our hearts and lives is an imposter. Is... is is someone who rightfully doesn't deserve to be there because the Lord Almighty deserves to be there. Then I'm going to throw it in reverse because that was my transition from where Emory was. Boy, Jesus Christ was revealed so huge, so powerful, and his progression of all that has been revealed, what I just read to you, oh, 
that revelation is huge from the, the point when the heavens opened up and John the Baptist was baptizing and he said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And then over and over, it just kept building. We've, talk, we've been talking about this in church lately, but I want to read from 1 John chapter 5 and verse 6. 1 John 5 and verse 6. Jesus Christ was revealed as God's son by his baptism in water, that was that first revelation. And by shedding his blood on the cross, not by water only, but by water and blood. And the spirit who is truth confirms it with his testimony. So we have these three witnesses, the spirit, the water, the blood. All these three agree since we believe human testimony. Surely we can believe the greater testimony that comes from God. And God has testified about his son. All who believe in the son of God know in their hearts that this testimony is true. And those who don't believe this are actually calling God a liar because they don't believe what God has testified about his son. I mean, the case for Christ Jesus and his authority that as he claims, he is the Messiah, the chosen one, the anointed one, the son of God, and he deserves to be on the throne of our hearts this is huge for us to not miss. And then the last thing, I, that I, I, as, I, as I just continue to go backwards today, I'm, I'm, I'm going from Revelation uh, to 1 John because the way Emery kind of set it up for me, so I just wanted to tie into that, is real so this love. This is devotional in reverse. It is. It yeah. is. Because you're like going you're gonna to catch all this. We're going to do chronological but, next year. Yes. Yeah, no, not, today. Today. <laughs> not today. <laughs> not today. <laughs> not today. Not today, baby. That's to awesome. Real love. Real love, and this is where I'm going to end today, in 1 John chapter 3. Real love, in 1 John 3, 16, is that Jesus gave up his life for us. Because of who he is, he demands to be on the throne of our heart. He deserves to be on the throne of our heart. But we know what real love, I don't want fake love. I want the real thing. We know what real love is because Jesus gave up his life for us. So we also ought to give up our lives for our brothers and sister. In 1 John 4 and 10, it says it talks about real love again. God showed us how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. This is real love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. Receive his real love Know his love and share that love with others because the real love is from Jesus Christ alone, sent from God the Father. That's awesome. You know, the problem about going backwards is I don't know where he's stopping. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you had the pause <laughs> right there. <laughs> Revelation 120, right? So, yeah, we, yeah, yeah, yeah. I took it to, I started at Revelation 1 8 and went backwards to 1 John yeah. 3. She said something. If ever there was a culture that needed the definition of real love, it is ours. Mm -hmm. it, it points, it paints this picture of real love being sacrificial. It's not an attraction. It's not a longing for. Yeah. It's not lust. It's not. A, it, right. It is it's not real a perception. love. It's not a perception it's of love. It's not fake love. Yeah. It's ultimately sacrificial. Yes. And I the Bible specific about yeah. that because it'll use three words in the Greek for Absolutely. love. Absolutely. Yeah. Eros, which is the erotic, sensual kind of All love. Phileo, yeah. or uh, yeah. where we mm -hmm. get Brotherly from love. Philadelphia. Philadelphia. Right. City of brotherly love, and then agape, which yeah. is self-sacrificing. Um, unconditional. love unconditional in its scope and and uh, and yeah and so Hosea was called to love Gomer unconditionally yeah against all odds unconditionally yeah I'm Extremely still going, I'm still going backwards but Revelation talks about God <laughs> loving us and, uh, and then we get to wisdom literature I don't know if we're going sideways or sideways. <laughs> I'm starting in the middle of the week. Chronological is 2023. Go it's 2023. Yeah, I'm, I'm we're boring. Still in 2023. I'm going to go forward. <laughs> I'm just going to go forward. Yeah. Yeah. Straight ahead. Oh, we oh. are. We're in Proverbs 29, verse 1 through 18. I'm trying to go in that order. Uh, <laughs> this ties in so much oh. with what Emery has already shared um, from Hosea about choices. Uh, I think a lot of times. 
we live our day to day not thinking about our choices, not mm-hmm. realizing the impact of our choices. Yeah. In our wisdom literature, it shows us two different things about our choices. Both are very, very important. The first is that our choices directly impact our lives. Um, each one of us personally, the choices we make impact who we are, how we live, all of that. Uh, verse 6 says, An evil person is caught up by sin, but the righteous one sings and rejoices. Verse 8 Mockers inflame a city, but the wise turn away from anger. Um, verse 11, a fool gives full vent to his anger, but a wise person hold, holds it in check. And so these choices that we make with, are we going to choose to follow righteousness, or are we choose to follow wicked? Are we choosing to follow wisdom, or are we choosing to follow foolish desires? Um, they directly impact our lives and how we live our lives. Um, and then my favorite one, verse 18, it says, Without revelation, people run wild, but the one who follows divine instruction will be happy. Who we choose to follow. Again, that idea of who is on our throne, that directly impacts our lives. Those choices are greatly important. And I think this is the lie that we fall into more than, more than this one even, is that, well, my choices only impact me. Uh, they don't impact anybody else, and that is that is for sure a lie. The choices we make impact not only ourselves, they impact our family, they impact our friends, they impact the world around us. And uh, we see these verses pointing us in that direction also. Uh, verse 2, it says, When the righteous flourish, the people rejoice, but when the wicked rule, people groan. Uh, verse 3, A man who loves wisdom brings joy to his father. But the one who consorts with prostitutes destroy his wealth. Uh, verse 10, bloodthirsty men hate an honest person, but the upright care about him. Um, lastly, verse 14, a king who judges the poor with fairness, his throne will be established forever. These choices that we make each and every day on a small level or on a big level, um, they have consequences, they have impact, and that is for our own lives and that is also for those around us. So. Uh, my encouragement as we read this is to put it into practice and to to not be flippant, um, to not be flippant with our choices, to not just go through the motions, which is so easy to do, but be intentional. And as we read God's Word, and we're allowing that to have impact in our lives, which then will have impact on our choices, which then will have impact on our lives and those that we are in contact with. So, Awesome. Good stuff. Well, listen, be faithful to reading. We're coming in a home stretch. You're going to have holidays, people coming in. Try to get ahead and don't be afraid to get ahead by listening as you're cleaning the house. As long as God's word is, mm-hmm. you know, give it thought as you mm-hmm. as you go in and, um, and read it and listen to it. We love you. God bless you. We'll see you in church on Sunday.